focus is the Mr. Fly here, hope you're well. Now it's the 4th of September, which means I'm a little bit late this month with my newspaper review. Apologies for that, I've been away on holiday and just haven't managed to do it, but uh, better late than never, as they say. Bumper edition for you this time, we've got uh, five papers to go through, and uh, if you stick around and stay tuned for the next few minutes, I'll pick out some of the stories that have uh, just caught my eye over the last month in the UK motorcycling press. Okay, so the first paper then, uh, I've got uh, four things that I want to show you here. Um, oh, by the way, new camera angle. Um, don't know what you think of this. This is the uh, welcome to the throbbing heart of the uh, Missenden Flyer operation. Uh, I, I mean, this is where I normally film it, but uh, anyway, slightly different angle for you, so uh, let me know what you think. Uh, and also, I'm using the mic actually on the GoPro session, so um, I'm going for the simplistic approach this time. Let's see if it works. Anyway, first story uh, that I picked out here from the um, paper from nearly a month ago now uh, is this one. And these are the new spy shots of the brand new uh, BMW S1000RR. Um, the bike is going through a massive refresh, it turns out, for. I'm not sure when it's due to come out. It says, oh, actually, it's expected as a 2019 model, so we ain't going to see this for sale for, you know, another year or so yet. But uh, I just wonder what you thought of this, if you saw this. Um, it's just, I don't know, the, the S1000RR is an amazing bike. When I rode it a couple of months back, I mean, there's no doubt the thing is an absolute weapon of a sports bike. It's an amazing piece of kit, lovely to ride. But for me, the thing just doesn't look very nice. And I didn't like, and I'm always commenting about this, the asymmetric front end of the thing just doesn't do it for me. Well, they've redesigned it and they've taken away that asymmetric front end. But it seems now to be channeling a bit of, um, I don't know, maybe a bit of KTM RC390 from some of these shots. Uh, what I'm saying is I think that even though they've redesigned the bike to look um, slightly different, I don't think they've done a great job on the looks of it again. For me, sports bikes are bought, you know, from the heart, not necessarily from the head and therefore things like the way the thing looks is a massive part of it. So for me, I could never buy a BMW S1000RR because the thing just doesn't look anywhere near as nice as, for example, the Yamaha R1 or my favourite of them all, the Panigale, uh, which I still think is the most beautiful bike ever made. So uh, sorry BMW, you're going to have to try a bit harder to make the thing uh, look a bit better. Um, bit of a shame, but anyway, we'll see. Obviously it's not uh, production yet. It's going to be a while before they release it officially. These are just spy shots, but uh, interesting to hear your thoughts on that. So that was the first thing that uh, caught my eye. Uh, second story here, not actually this amazing picture of the week where this guy is almost flung off his bike on a race, but it's actually this um, the story at the bottom here. Is it the end of engines? And this is the story that was around a few weeks back when the government announced that it's going to put a ban on petrol and diesel vehicles, brand new ones, from 2040. So in 30, well, 23 years time, you won't be able to buy a brand new vehicle that's petrol or diesel powered. Um, and of course this question says, well, does this apply to bikes as well? And we can only assume that of course it does. And I'm just wondering whether you think that's a good thing or not. Um, you, you read some reviews of uh, electric bikes and they sound amazing in terms of the torque, the instant power that they give you. Um, but so far it doesn't seem that anyone's come up with one at a, a good price, you know, comparable with normal petrol powered bikes. Uh, and also one that's got a good range. So uh, just wonder what your thoughts were on electric bikes. I personally, uh, I can't wait to have a go on an electric bike. I'm sure it's just a matter of time before we see more of them around and that things like the range get sorted. Uh, and the first manufacturer that makes one that's got a good range and it's a reasonable price, I think is gonna absolutely mop up. Uh, I think the thrill of riding one of these things is just gonna be absolutely amazing. It is a little bit disappointing, I guess, that you lose the uh, oral excitement, the, you know, the noise that the, that the petrol engine bikes make, but. I'm sure we'll get used to these, and uh, I for one can't wait to see those coming. But uh, having said all that, of course, just because new bikes um, aren't going to be allowed to be sold from 2040 with petrol engines, then that doesn't mean to say we ain't going to be riding, because let's face it, there's going to be bikes around for ages that we've all been riding. So uh, I don't think in my lifetime I'm going to see a completely uh, electric fleet of vehicles yet, um, which actually I'm quite glad about, because there's always going to be us enthusiast riders that want to stick with uh, petrol engine bikes and indeed cars. So that was that one. And the next story here, and I have to say, I haven't gone through these. These are coming up as a little bit of a surprise to me because I haven't reviewed these before I switched the camera on to check what stories I'd highlighted. Oh yeah, here we go. This is the new uh, Suzuki GSX-R250, um, which is their sort of baby sports bike. It's just come out this month. There was a press um, launch done. Actually, in, in the last week, I saw some stuff on Twitter and so on about the press launch of this. Uh, I think it was this one, or was that the 125? Maybe that was the 125. Anyway, uh, my point is, uh, it's great that they're bringing out these sports bikes. This thing looks absolutely cool. I love um, smaller capacity bikes because you can absolutely rag them and you don't get yourself into too much trouble. Um, and this one looks really good. It looks just like its big brother. It's got an amazing TFT uh, display. Um, you know, and as far as I can see, it's an absolute winner. So can't wait to have a go on that. I'll need to talk to my friends at uh, Suzuki and see uh, when they get one of these in, whether I can have a ride. But uh, yeah, really looking forward to having a go on that. If you're a new rider these days, you'll really sport for choice on, on uh, smaller bikes. Absolutely amazing, so I really like that. Okay, so just a quick one. And here we go, another of the MCN tests. Just uh, 
pointed this one out because what they've done here is a test of the sort of um, big sports tourers. Sports tourers are that you know that niche of the bike market that's been sort of neglected in the last I don't know five years I suppose. Uh, and now it seems that some of the adventure bikes have sort of morphed into sports tourers. So here they've got things like the um, the BMW S1000 XR, which is an amazing bike to ride, but again has that asymmetric front end that I don't like. Uh, they've also got here uh, the Yamaha MT10, the Tour Edition, absolutely amazing bike. I love the uh, MT10 when I rode that. Uh, the GSXR uh, S, sorry, 1000F, the Touring uh, Suzuki. Uh, the old favourite, the Yamaha FJR 1300. Uh, and so on, uh, and also the new Ducati Super Sport, um, which I have the Super Sport S, which I haven't ridden yet, but it's uh, you know it looks sort of Panigale esque, um, but very much is a sports tour bike, and I'm looking forward hopefully to riding that at some point in the future. I've been talking to Ducati recently, and it looks like I might be able to get some uh, get some long term loans of bikes there too. So looking forward to riding that. So an interesting sort of group test with a whole range of bikes there. Um, the reason why I brought this up is to basically just go to the which one came out top. And uh, I'm really pleased to say MCN out of all those bikes have rated the MT10 Touring Edition, the top bike as a uh, sports tourer, um, which I think is, it just kind of, um, not cements, what's the word I'm looking for? Well, it's in agreement with my thoughts because I, I just really love riding the MT10. Haven't been the Touring Edition, but uh, it's basically the same bike with some panniers and a screen. Uh, so interesting that it beat off competition like the S1000XR and the Super Sport S which uh, you know have been getting rave reviews and the FJR 1300 came in at fourth. Um, bit of an odd collection of bikes I suppose because they haven't got things in here like the BMW RT which is, I know they refer to it as a full dress tourer uh, but you could argue that the FJR 1300 is a full dress tourer as well so once again a bit of an odd slice but um, you know I quite enjoy these, these tests that uh, MCN do and that is the one from early August uh, this month, uh, last month August now, goodness me. Okay the second paper then because there's four here, I'm going to flash them quite quickly. This first story that's caught my eye on this paper, Norton engine deal worth millions, and this is the um, smaller engine that Norton uh, designed a while back. It's about a year ago or so, I think, that they announced that they were developing this 650cc engine, and they've now sold the rights to a Chinese company, Zongshen, uh, such that they can build this and uh, put it into some of their bikes. And there's a bit of discussion about whether this is a good thing for Norton or not. Um, it basically spells the end of this, I think, the end of this engine uh, going into a bike that's going to be built by Norton in the UK. It seems like they've sold the rights to it and it's going to be used in Chinese manufactured bikes that may or may be um, branded Norton, not too sure. Oh yeah, just flicking through the detail there, what Norton have said is they are still going to bring out a 650 themselves, but it'll be a different engine, a different platform. So quite interesting that um, you know they've sold the rights to this 650 that they already had to Zongshen, um, but they're going to come up with a new 650 twin for their own smaller bike. So. Uh, Interesting, we'll see what they come up with. Uh, you know, these Nortons are obviously a, a quite a small scale manufacturer and it takes a long time for their bikes to come out. So looking forward to see uh, what they have with that. So, anyway, so that was that, um, but the point is of that story is it's got to be good news because that's going to bring a lot of money into, into Norton so they can spend that on developing bikes for lots of you and me to ride. So, so that's fantastic. Second story here, this was just a quick thing. This is a, a new feature that MCN are doing about retro bikes and custom bikes, it seems, in their, uh, in the magazine there, or the paper now. Uh, and this particular one, which is a, um, an old Empire motorcycles take on the, um, on the Triumph T120, it looks amazing. The reason why I pointed this out is uh, what they've done with the instruments on this, because there was some, you know, there was some difficulty making the, the front end of this thing look tidy and clean. They've actually um, put in a Bluetooth instrument cluster uh, and, and obviously there are no wires needed from the instrument cluster to actually the sensors that are sending uh, sending the readings up to the up to the cluster. So I just thought that was a great idea. As long as you don't have to charge batteries and stuff and you don't have any hassle with the technology, I just wonder whether we're going to see more Bluetooth wiring looms effectively in, in bikes in the future. It just struck me as a great idea. I don't know why uh, manufacturers aren't doing that anyway. Maybe they will in the future, who knows. So that was that one. Um, oh, a letter. Well, actually, the editorial in this week's um, paper was interesting because this was talking about this news story that's um, gone a little bit off the boil, actually, the last couple of weeks, but certainly the beginning of August, we're seeing an awful lot on the UK um, news about um, so-called scooter thugs uh, and, motors, uh, and crimes um, caused by people on scooters. I've mentioned it before. Uh, and basically, um, Andy Colton, the editor of MCN here, is saying that, that unfortunately this sort of coverage is giving us all as bikers a bad name. And I completely agree with him. Uh, and the thing is, what's missing from the coverage, as far as I can see, is they often talk about these scooter gangs that are um, committing crimes. They talk about 
snatching handbags or acid attacks or um, stealing phones, things like that. They don't actually mention that a lot of these acid attacks are actually scooter um, criminals or scooter-based criminals stealing motorcycles. Uh, I think that's the largest um, uh, sector of crime that they've been they've been causing. But that bit seems to be uh, seems to be lacking in the mainstream media, and that annoys me because it's actually motorcyclists that are the victims here, uh, not just the perpetrators. But if you just watch the news, it comes across as if somehow you know anyone who rides a scooter and then by implication two wheelers motorcyclists are criminals. So it just goes. Once again, I don't know why motorcyclists get such a bad rap in the UK. Um, you know, the government doesn't support us in terms of encouraging us on the road, yet, you know, we could be the solution to congestion and, um, uh, and all the rest of it. Uh, yet, here we go, news story in the mainstream uh, press again that's basically painting us as the bad guys, and in fact, in this case, we're the victims. So, you know, there we go, that's just one of those things. All right, and then the last story from here. Uh, again, another feature that MCN has started doing has been called the bikes that made us, and they pick out um, some what they see as um, significant bikes of the last couple of decades, and then they find some people that have owned them, and then they make some comments on them. I only point this one out because this week uh, they chose the Venerable Triumph Tiger, uh, which is a bike that I absolutely love. If you've watched uh, my videos for a while, you'll know that I used to own a Triumph Tiger 1050, uh, and I also borrowed last year the new Tiger Sport for a while from Triumph, who kindly lent me one. I really love the bike, and I still, in a way, I kind of miss it. It's, uh, to my mind, that's what a sport tourer should be like. It's got an amazingly grunty engine. It's comfortable, and I think it looks great. It's, uh, it's one of those bikes that um, you know. I think you either love or hate. But uh, I've always loved the, loved the look of the Tiger, and um, one day I may even go back to one. I don't know. At the moment, I'm sticking with the GS, but uh, I do miss my old Tiger in a lot of ways. So there we go. So that's that. Next one, rattling through at a rate now. Okay, first story here, it's a surprise to me as it is to you. What have we got? Here we go. New entry level triumphs coming is the headline. And this is again another one of these joint venture stories because Triumph have teamed up with the Indian manufacturer Bajaj. Well, I think I read in another article somewhere recently uh, are now the biggest uh, manufacturer of motorcycles in the world. They're Indian based, as I say. Anyway, Triumph have done this uh, joint venture with them. Um, to build smaller capacity bikes, which is great news. I think they're going to be sold worldwide as well. It's not just going to be um, sold in the Indian market. And I think this can only be a good thing for biking generally. It can massively up the scale of production for Triumph. And uh, and also, I think in those you know emerging markets, places like India, I think a small Triumph would absolutely sell like hotcakes as well as actually, I think, in the UK. So I think that's just great news. And, um, you know, all the bikes I've seen coming out of the Badge Edge factory, things like the KTM and the, um, the BMW G310, um, the quality of those things is absolutely amazing. So great that Triumph have got on that as well. So really interesting story. Don't know when that's going to start happening, but, um, but it looks like to start with they're going to go with a 750cc bike, which doesn't strike me as that small, but then go these days it is, I guess. But, uh, but there we are. So that's a good news story for Triumph. Okay, this next uh, article I've pulled up, this is the um, new BMW K1600B for bagger. They've basically taken the, the massive six-cylinder K1600 machine uh, and chopped the back end off and, and uh, baggerized it. Is that a word? Anyway, it is now. Um, I guess to appeal to the American market because they like this sort of thing, don't they? They're you know bagger versions of Harleys and what have you. But I don't know. Looking at it, the thing to me just looks, well, frankly, horrible. Um, so MCN have reviewed it. They say actually it's a pretty good bike. It's a little bit cheaper than the uh, the big full dress K1600 as well, the Tora. Um, so if you're in that sort of um, market, perhaps it's for you. But uh, I personally just don't like the look of that thing, and the, and the reason for highlighting this story is really to ask, who in the UK is going to buy one of these? Do you think anyone, you know, do you fancy getting one of these? I just can't see them selling very well here. But there we go, I guess we're not the primary target market, but they are selling them here anyway, it seems. So there we go, that's the bagger. And last but not least from this one, uh, what have I done here? Oh yeah, <laughs> what, uh, the reason why I've pulled this up is it's my old um, bugbear again, PCP. They've actually got, look, a 24-page pullout in this magazine, or this paper, about PCP deals, 24 page pull out, 79 stunning PCP deals. Uh, I just think this is a way of getting people that can't really afford a new bike to buy a new bike, and uh, something about it is just wrong. For me, I know, I know some people find this absolutely fine, I've talked about this loads of times before, we've exchanged comments, I know it works for some people, that's great. But for me, spending money every month and then at the end of the period, three years or whatever it is, having nothing to show for it, having to give it back, uh, just to me is the wrong way to go about these things. And also, you don't own the bike. You, you know, you have limited mileage. Um, you have to put a deposit down to start with. Uh, and when MCN say things like, you know, for £139 a month, you can get a brand new uh, GS Rally, which is a lovely looking bike. It's a little bit disingenuous because they don't talk about the deposit you have to put down or the final payment, or you end up with nothing. So once again, I see the magazine or paper 
pushing uh, PCP. It's not just MCN, all the mainstream bike magazine to push it as well. And I don't quite understand what, what's going on there, why it's so important for the uh, for the magazines to push it. Um, because it makes it sound like it's the way to go. And I just can't help thinking that, you know, that's maybe that's the next um, financial crash <laughs> is going to be based on that. Not just PCP for bikes, but cars are sold this way as well. And I think there's a lot of people out there effectively getting loans that they can ill afford. But there you go. So there's that one. Uh, getting through them now. Okay, only a couple of stories that I picked out of this one. This is the uh, August the 23rd edition. A little bit thin on interest, I thought this one was. Sorry, MCN. But once again, uh, it's an electric bike story that I've picked out. This one is called Fast Learner. This is the first ride of the Zero S ZF 6.5. That's uh, quite a name, isn't it? Uh, but this actually looks like quite a, you know, quite a nice little bike. Uh, once again, like I said earlier, the problem with it is, is the range isn't quite there and it's quite expensive. So the price, after a, a £1,500, I think, yeah, £1,500 government grant you can get in the UK against this, the price is actually 9190 for effectively a bike that's, um, well, it's learner legal, so it's, it's regarded as, um, you know, not a high performance bike in terms of, of that because of our uh, learner legal laws here uh, are based on power output or, or peak figures. Um, so this puts out peak figures of 30 brake horsepower, so it falls within the um, um, sort of learner category, if you like. But of course, that makes it actually accelerate because of the torque that it's got. It out accelerates an S1000RR. So if you're a new rider, getting on or straight onto one of these may not be a great idea. But uh, again, it's just I think it's quite a nice looking bike, and it does show that at, even though nine thousand pounds is a lot of money for that sort of bike, um, it does show that electric bikes are starting to get a little bit uh, nearer real world. And um, you know, another two to five years, I reckon, once they get the size and weight of these batteries sorted and the range sorted. We're all going to be riding these things. I can't wait to have a go at one. All right, so that was that one. And then the other story here. Oh, yeah, I've raised this one. They've done, again, one of the comparisons. This is a quite a quirky one. It's looking at the um, Dakar winners of the past uh, and comparing them, the modern-day versions, things like the the new BMW R90 Scrambler, which I so love. That's the, the main picture here. Uh, and it's uh, showing it against the old original bikes that won the Dakar and, and maybe inspired these current range of retro bikes. Um, but the reason why I mentioned this article in particular is because these these bikes, the originals, are actually owned by Harry Metcalf. He's the guy that runs Harry, um, Harry's Garage, the website that I've mentioned in the past. Uh, if you don't, if you're not a subscriber to Harry's Garage, it's not a specifically motorcycle uh, YouTube channel, but uh, he, he mainly does cars. But he's also a keen biker, and he obviously owns lots of bikes. Uh, so it was really interesting that MCN have teamed up with Harry Metcalf and done this uh, done this article. Uh, I'm a huge fan of, uh, of Harry and Harry's Garage. If you don't watch it, I recommend you do so. It's a great channel. Anyway, so um, nothing more really to say on that other than uh, great to see uh, Harry featured in MCN. Maybe MCN will start to feature more YouTubers. Who knows? Okay, that's that one. Last but not least, this is uh, last week's issue. Uh, came out last Wednesday, which is August the 30th. Just a couple of things here to finish off with for this month's review. Number one, again, I want to go back to uh, Andy Colton. Uh, he's the editor, and uh, he's... Um, editorial that he put in uh, the paper this for this week and he's talking about this new story about um, the, again it's a UK specific one where this pilot has been um, granted by the government where trucks are going to be allowed to drive in convoy not something that's been allowed on UK roads so far and what they're saying is um, there'll be convoys of three trucks the first one of which has a driver and then the other three are linked wirelessly or the other two rather are linked wirelessly and although they'll have a driver on board they're only there for monitoring purposes the other two trucks will be controlled by the first truck and uh, the idea is that because they'll be driving much closer, they'll be within the slipstream, much more efficient from a fuel point of view, and it means that emissions will be cut down and theoretically everything gets cheaper. Um, and what Andy Colton is saying is that this is a bit of a flawed theory, and I agree with him. Uh, and the issue is not, not the fact that they're in convoy and it's going to be more efficient, because that's undoubtedly probably just a fact. I guess somebody's done some research into this. But the fact is our roads are congested, and it's bad enough trying to get by a single truck now. Can you imagine trying to get by three trucks, particularly if you're in a car? Uh, absolute nightmare. And on our motorways, which have an awful lot of um, junctions and exits, uh, sometimes you can be you know, going past a truck, uh, and you're trying to look at the exit signs, and you can't read them because the truck's in the way. If there's now going to be three trucks, one, on the, one after the other in close proximity, you're going to miss your signs. I just think it's... Um, you know, it's just a rubbish idea, I think. But there we go. Maybe it's the way of the future. Uh, Andy Corton says that he thinks it's a, uh, it's a solution for a problem that doesn't exist. And I think he's probably quite right about that. Although I do think driverless vehicles will be the way of the future. I don't like the idea of these convoys for the reasons I've just said. But uh, 
driverless cars in particular, I think are an, are an amazing idea. When you think what they'll do for our insurance premiums, the fact that um, accidents will be cut down, uh, and the fact that you know you could you could go out for a drink and you can summon your car to come and pick you up and stuff like that. I mean, it just you could absolutely transform the way we transport ourselves around. And again, 50 years time, sadly I probably won't be around to see it, but uh, I'm convinced the roads will be full of driverless cars and it'll be the world will be much better for it. But uh, maybe not if we get these uh, convoys of trucks. So that was that one. Um, okay, nearly there now. Oh, this is a little test that uh, piqued my interest uh, because uh, MCN put the BMW G310R up against the Duke 390, the little KTM that I've been borrowing of late and I've so enjoyed. I also really enjoyed the BMW 310R when I rode that. They're both amazing bikes. And again, it just shows that if you're just getting into biking now, uh, what fantastic machines are available to you. Personally, if I was to choose one of the two bikes, I would go for the Duke. I just think it's got that little bit of... Uh, little bit more attitude and I love the way the thing looks it's got an aggressive look I love the front light not everybody does but I do uh, if I was going for that, either one of those two they're both similarly priced I think the KTM is a little bit more a few hundred quid more than I go for the KTM but that's not to say the BMW isn't a good uh, piece of kit in any way they're both amazing you wouldn't go wrong with either and MCM have said well they put the KTM first as well KTM at 4600 and the G310R at 4300 so 300 quid in it, um, but both amazing, amazing bikes. Considering uh, as a learner rider, you can uh, you know you can actually get these now and ride them. Brilliant. And also they're both built, I think, at the Bajaj factory, that Indian factory that uh, we talked about earlier. That Triumph have now got the uh, engine deal and so on with. So uh, great stuff coming out of there. Really good news, I think, and uh, look forward to uh, seeing more of those sorts of bikes coming on the market. And of course, it encourages new riders into it as well. So that's got to be a good thing. Okay then, so the final story I've picked out here, sorry this is going on a bit long, is uh, this one here. Uh, and this is a comparison of the uh, Triumph Street Triple RS, another bike that I've, uh, I know pretty well, having borrowed one long term from my friends at Triumph. Uh, pitting it against a late model Daytona. The Daytona, uh, now you can still buy a few new in dealers, but they're not making it anymore, which begs the question what they're going to do to replace it, we'll see. Uh, but interesting, the, this, the um, premise of this article was, was which is the best road bike, the Daytona or the Street Triple? Uh, and they actually came out saying that the Street Triple is the better bike, which is interesting. I've never ridden a Daytona myself, but uh, a lot of people have asked me what I think, uh, you know, how I would compare the two. So I haven't been able to answer it. So it was interesting that uh, MCN have done that they're here, and that's why I raise it today. So there we go, that's it. That's my uh, very quick flash through the, uh, the articles that caught my interest in the last month. Hope that's been of some interest to you. If you want to find out any more about these, you can buy back issues, of course, of MCN. I love MCN. I read it every month cover to cover, or every week, I should say, cover to cover. Um, and uh, if you've never checked it out, recommend you do so. They don't, I don't owe them anything. They don't owe me anything. So, um, you know, I'm not just saying that. I genuinely think it's, it's a, great, uh, a great publication, and it's the way I keep up to date with what's going on in the motorcycle world. Anyway, that's it for this time. Until next time, I look forward to speaking to you. This has been the Mr. Fly. Cheerio.